The next speaker up for today is Daniel Yilk, and he'll be talking about Python in space, the end body problem. A uh, little introduction about Daniel. He, in his own words, is an app developer, is a CTO and a Python developer almost at the same time. So, yeah, excited for the new talk. Uh, let's welcome Daniel with a round of applause, please. It's working. Test, test. We're still loading. Hi. Welcome to Python and the N-Body problem. My name is Daniel, and I'm really happy to see you all here tonight. Um, and we'll be, we'll be talking about celestial mechanics today. Celestial mechanics is the science of calculating and predicting the paths that the sun, the moon, the planets, galaxies, and everything in between take across the sky. It's a fun story, and like most fun stories, it started with a huge mistake. You see, about 2,000 years ago, when scientists uh, first created models of how the Earth and celestial bodies interacted, they placed Earth in the center. So of course the Sun, and like the say five planets or so, had to revolve around the Earth. This is called the geocentric model. And that leads us to some weird paths that the Sun and the planets have to take in order for this to make sense. Because from our point of view, like some of the planets, sometimes they seem to move backwards. And, but, you know, they had their priorities back then, and we have ours. And one of these uh, scientists is Claudius Ptolemaeus. In this, in this picture here, he is inventing the well, actually. Um, he took some records of the ancient Babylonians about celestial observations and combined them into a mathematical model that is basically geometry and it uses epicycles, that is like cycles within cycles uh, to describe the planetary orbits in a geometric way. And this is uh, 150 after Christ, by the way. And this model was basically accepted in all of Europe until about the Middle Ages. But there were other people who had a different idea earlier. First, this uh, gentleman here is Aristarchus of Samos. He worked out the heliocentric model way ahead of everyone else. Uh, but not a lot of people listened to him. Uh, he, lived, he lived about 310 before Christ to 230 before Christ. And in this picture, by the way, he looks kind of pleased with himself because he just made up a joke about solar winds opening up Uranus. Um, then we have Hypatia of Alexandria, a mathematician who lived between 350 and 415. And she seems to have confirmed and extended Aristarchus' calculation as well. She, by the way, is not very amused in this picture because she wanted to make that fart joke. But only in the 1500s came along Nicholas Copernicus, and he really... Um, his contribution really changed the accepted wisdom throughout Europe. Uh, in, this pic in this picture, he looks kind of miffed because he's kind of annoyed by the whole fart joke thing, and also because he's proving once again that for a scientific or technical discovery to be taken seriously for, for, um, from the viewpoint of other men, a man has to, has to repeat it. And he's like, guys, we really need to work on that. Listen to women more. So Copernicus came up with the idea, okay, let's place the sun in the center. And there are circular paths around the center. Uh, these are perfect circles, as you can see in my incredibly awesome drawing skills, by the way. And let's place the planets on these concentric circles. And this basically is the launching point for modern astronomy. Um, this model had a lot of criticism, of course, like until uh, like for about 150 years, people were like not really sure because there's so much stuff to criticize about this. Like, yes, okay, it does uh, predict uh, or it does like explain why we have seasons because like the Earth's axis is kind of tilted relative to its orbit, but like the stars, they would have to be huge. Like that can't be right, right? And I mean. It is also against common sense because then the Earth itself would have to move. And I mean, look at the Earth. A, it doesn't feel like it's moving right now. 
And B, like, I mean, why would it move? Remember, they didn't have a concept of gravity back then. So they were just like, why would it move? And they were like, okay, mathematically it does make sense. So there was like some scientific consensus back then. But after all, it took a, quite a while for it to be accepted. And about half a century after Copernicus, along comes this gentleman, Johannes Kepler. In this picture, he's trying to eat sushi for the first time. <laughs> and what he did is he extended, um, he extended Copernicus's model. Um, he used some observation of Mars's orbit and built a model that would explain the movement of Mars and its moons because that didn't exactly fit the perfect concentric circles theory. So instead, he uses ellipses. So the planets move in ellipses around the sun, and the sun is like in one of the two focus points of the ellipse. And for moons, of course, it's the same, but with their, their root planets. And, and by the way, if anyone here in the audience is playing uh, the game Kerbal Space Program, this is exactly how Kerbal Space Program calculates because this is very like non-intensive calculations. And the model is basically, if we have the sun in the middle and then we have an orbit of a planet that's going around the sun, then I can like create line segments that split up this ellipse uh, and I, will, I, I can create these line segments in a way that each of them has the same area. So if I continue this, like it looks like this for example, and each of these line segments covers the same area. So what that means is like a planet that will move along this orbit will always sweep the same area in the same amount of time. But for that to make sense, the planet has to move faster if it's closer to, its, to the sun than, than if it's far away. And that very, very well, like that fits very well with the observations that they had at the time. So this is kind of good, like Kerbal Space Program uses it so it can't be that bad. Um, but then along came Isaac Newton, who is very disappointed because he's, he's watching Kepler eat sushi. Um, <laughs> he tried to use the geometric model to predict the planet's motions, and he kind of failed, which is uh, because Newton was kind of a genius and he created his own telescopes that were way better than what was there before, and so he could observe closer and like find find various like small incongruencies and he was like okay this doesn't fit but he had a different idea because he already like started working out on this uh, on his like various laws of motion and so he said there is a gravitational interactions between the planets that is affecting their orbits and this is this is true for all the planets in the solar system but also like everything out there as well from the smallest to the largest. And this, this was new. This was exciting because remember, before everything before this was basically geometry, whereas this here is calculus. So this gives us like a rule set to predict and analyze and do so much more. So what is Newton's formula for the force of gravity? The force of gravity between two bodies is proportional to their masses multiplied divided by their distance squared. So we have the distance squared in here, so we have like the inverse proportional law when like, if you go farther away, then like the gravity, gravitational influence kind of falls down pretty quickly and stuff like that. And this says proportional, so the squiggly thing means proportional. Um, because there's a constant missing here that Newton didn't really discover that was discovered a bit later by Gauss. But basically this method is sound and even the, the moon landings were calculated using Newtonian physics. So it's pretty good. And you can do cool stuff with that. For example, you, maybe you want to make a case that there is like an undiscovered planet nine out there. So not Pluto, but like further out and larger, but it's so far away from the sun. So it's cold and dark and it's very hard to, to detect. So what you do is you plug your observations of known bodies, you plug that into the Newtonian model and find incongruencies uh, that, that, make you like, that make their orbits kind of inexplicable. So you construct yourself a hypothetical body on a specific orbit and that fits the incongruencies or that would explain the incongruencies and bam, you know where to point your uh, telescopes. And for Planet 9, by the way, we are in the pointing telescopes phase. 
So it is very easy to calculate the uh, gravitational interactive force between two bodies using Newtonian physics. But as soon as there's more bodies, things get a little bit harder to predict because for every, bodies, like, for every body that you add, like its gravity influences all the other bodies and their orbital parameters, which in turn influence all the other bodies. So this gets complicated. And so for n bodies, you have more or less n squared interactions or steps to calculate. And this is, in the simplest terms, it's basically the n body problem. So let me give like a quick excursion into big O notation. In computer science, big O notation is used to classify algorithms according to their running time or their um, space requirements as their input size grows. So uh, we use the letter O um, because the growth rate of a function is also called the order of a function. And a, like, I, I can classify various algorithms using their order to compare these algorithms. And the O notation basically tells me like the upper bound for, an, uh, for the running time of an algorithm. Uh, for example, I've plotted here um, running times of, like for, for an input of size n, so n is any natural number, um, I, I've, 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 you see here the growth rates of the function n, the function n times log n, and the uh, function n squared. And this is for n up to 10, so this is like, it doesn't seem that bad, right? I mean, the, what, how bad could n squared be? be? But let's go to 100, and suddenly you begin to notice some differences, and then let's get to 1,000, and now look at my, look at my y-axis. Like, this is, this is intense, and this is why the n-body problem is hard to calculate, because like, once you get like, to a certain number of bodies, and I mean, like, we have at least 1,000 bodies in our solar system alone, it gets a bit hard. So this is the solution to the n-body problem in Python in like a very naive implementation. So what we do basically is we loop through all our bodies and then inside of that loop, we loop through all the other bodies and apply the Newtonian acceleration form function to that, to those two bodies. Like so say like, okay, this body's motion vector is now influenced by this body's mass from that distance, right? Um, and of course, this gets uh, in, this gets like uh, this is our as our n our number of bodies grows. Of course, this gets it gets very intensive. So, enter Pete Hutt and Josh Barnes. Uh, they wanted to simulate what it looks like when large galaxies collide. And the simple solution they didn't really like it because they didn't really want to wait for. 20 years for the simulation to complete. I, I didn't find a picture of Josh Barnes, <laughs> but uh, here's Pete Hurt, uh, looking like he's about to drop the hottest hip hop album in astrophysics. <laughs> um, this person is an amazing person, it seems like. I've never met him, but I would shake his hand. Like he does research in computer simulation of large, uh, of dense stellar systems. So exactly what we're talking to, talking about today, uh, but he has like all these interdisciplinary collaboration. He's like uh, he's, he dabbles in natural science, in computer science, cognitive psychology, and even philosophy. Uh, he's also the co-founder of the B612 Foundation, which is a fun foundation that pro focuses on the prevention of asteroid impacts on Earth. And he has his own asteroid named after him, which is uh, asteroid 17031 Pete Hutt. So Hutt and Barnes uh, released a paper in 1986 in which they describe an algorithm that is used to calculate an approximate solution to the n-body problem in o, in, in o of n log n time, which as we've seen is like better. So how does this work? In the paper, they describe it like this. They take all these bodies that we want to simulate and org organize them into a tree. And this is always a quad tree for two-dimensional simulations and an oct tree for three-dimensional simulations. And we'll see why in a second. And so if I want to simulate all the 
uh, gravitational attractions that a body experiences, then I will go, instead of like going through all the other bodies and doing the calculation, I will go through the tree and, oops, I've, I've jumped ahead a little bit. Hang on. So while I'm constructing the tree, in each node of the tree, I will save the combined mass and location of all the bodies that are below that tree. So I, like in each node, I will have like a virtual body that is like all the bodies below that combined. And so now, if I want to simulate the planet in, encircled in purple here on the right, um, I will, in fact, like I have a, like a, a cutoff function that tells me not to go too deep into the tree, the further away the, the, the body I'm simulating is. So for this, for example, like I would only use that virtual body that's saved in the upper node here to calculate the gravitational interactions, and I don't have to calculate all the bodies that are below it. And you can, you can imagine it like this. Maybe somewhere, like somewhere out there, there's a galaxy far, far away, and it gravitationally influences me right now. But because it's so far away, there's a completely neg negligible difference between this galaxy being like a galaxy made, up, made out of like a billion stars or just like one huge block of whatever. So Barnes Hutt here treats it like one huge block and, th and that's like how it reduces the complexity quite a lot. So for in our brute force method that I introduced earlier, um, for like for each body, I will have to go through all the other bodies. So I will have n times n being n squared complexity. In Barnes and Hub proof that with their cutoff function, you will always go approximately log n steps deep into the tree before you say like, okay, this is close enough. And they also prove that the, the error that they introduce is very neg negligible, by the way. And so this gives us n, lo n times log n which is the, the complexity we were hoping for. So now what I want to do is I want to invite you all to step with me through a, a step in the Barnes-Hutt algorithm. Um, feel free to raise your hand if it's too, too slow or too fast or whatever, and then I will try to, to cut down. So we have this lovely star field here, and luckily in the lower right corner, by some freak accident, there's nothing there. So we have some space here where I can show you how the tree will look like. So Barnes Hut always looks at a area of space and assigns that to one of the tree nodes first. So the first area that we're looking at is just the whole system here. And so we create a tree node for that system. And then the question that Barnes Hut asks is, is there a body in here? The answer is yes, of course. And is there more than one body in there? And if there's more than one body, we split it up into four quadrants. And that's where the quad tree comes from. And so now we look at the upper left corner of the screen. Then we look at this quadrant and we basically repeat the steps. So is there a body in there? Yes. So we create a node. <coughs> and is there more than one body in there? Yes, so we split it up. And then again, we look at the upper, the upper left quadrant of our, new, of our new split up tree. And again, there's a body, there's in fact two bodies, so we create a node and then split the quadrant up again. But now we're finally at the lowest end of this part of the tree. So is there a body? Yes, but it's the only body. So we just save this very body into the tree and we're done with that quadrant, and we can move on to the next quadrant, which is one to the right. This one is empty. So we save a non-value, and we just move on. The next one is the next one is empty as well, so again, we save none and move on. And then the last quadrant of that subtree, uh, again, contains exactly one body. So we say, like, okay, let's save that body, and we're done with that whole subtree. We can go up one level again. This is none, so that's kind of easy. The next one is exactly one body, so we don't have to split up. We can just like save this body and be done with it. And the next one as well, that we can just save this one body and we don't have to do any splitting up to do. <coughs> so now we're done with the whole upper left quadrant of the screen, which corresponds to, hang on, I got a laser pointer, right? Okay, ah, which con corresponds to like the left, the left side of the, of the tree here. <coughs> so now upper right portion of the screen. Does it contain a body? It does. 
And in fact, <coughs> it contains more, so we're splitting it up. Oh, we're creating a node, and then we're splitting it up. And we look at the upper left, no splitting up necessary. We look at the upper right, no splitting up necessary. We look at the lower left, splitting up necessary. So we do split up, and again, we look at the various sub-quadrants, and we discover that there's one more splitting up that we need to do. So this part of the tree goes deeper than the other parts of the tree, and you see already that the tree only contains those parts that you really need, right? So we're not creating like this whole tree structure that is just a bunch of nonds, but the tree only exists where it's, it's necessary for the tree to exist. And I'm kind of stepping through this now, but, but be because I guess you kind of got the principle, but stop me if you want to go, or if you want me to go slow for the last quadrant. Because of course, remember the lower left is completely empty because it just contains our tree cam, and this one we split it up and then we're kind of done. Oh, all these slow animations, it's horrible. All right, this is how a horror tree looks like. And one thing, one thing to keep in mind is that the Barnes Hut algorithm cre recreates this tree at every step of the, of the simulation. So it's not like it tries to update the tree and manage like the various tree nodes because this could get complicated. Like for example, look at, look at this little planet here. Like, if by our calculation it would move a little bit up, then suddenly it would be in another quadrant, and it's like even if at a diff different level of the tree, and so it would get very complicated and intensive, like computational intensive. So in instead, we just throw away the tree and recreate it every step of the way. We have a tree now. What shall we do with the tree? Um, for each body, as I said before, we go through the tree starting at the top, and we ask ourselves at every node, is this true? So we look at, uh, at the quadrant of our current body, and the quadrant has a diameter, like the, it, it halves uh, uh, the further we go down to the tree, and we divide it by the distance to the other body that we look at. And so this means, like, and that has to be smaller than two. So what this means basically is that if this is correct, then I can prove to you, I won't right now, <laughs> but I can prove to you that it will never go, like it will have an average case of like going, to, going into n, uh, log n deep into the tree. And so obviously in the root node, this is probably not correct, so we can go one deeper. And so now our algorithm will look at this node, and again we say like, okay, no, still like we're not detailed enough, we can go one deeper, so we're looking at the subtree here. And so we're going down one more root node, uh, one more node, and we decide, like, okay, this is, this is like enough. We can stop here. We don't have to go down here. So instead of calculating those very bo those, those bodies down there, or even like the tree could go on for a, for a lot of levels, um, we, just calculate, uh, we just calculate the interaction with this body, then we skip this one because it's none, then the interaction with this body and with this body, and then we're kind of done for the upper left quadrant of the screen. All right, I hope I've confused you all a lot. <laughs> and next part is we're gonna look at some code. I uh, looked at the original paper and I also found various Im implementations in Java made by some very smart MIT people. And I thought like, hey, I'm half as smart. I should try to, to recreate this in Python. So. I chose to go with an object-oriented model because it's, it kind of fits the, the whole, the whole uh, premise very well. Like you have bodies that you simulate, and in fact, like the body is like our first class that I implemented. So a body is anything that has a mass and is affected by gravity. So it's either represents something that is real in the system that we're simulating, or it might be like a virtual body as constructed by Barnes Hutt. Uh, we track its position in space, and its velocity, and its mass. And bodies have uh, a few helper methods. The first is the distance to another body. <coughs> then we have an update method that just takes a amount of time and then just moves the body for that amount of time along its velocity vector. Like this is basically what happens between calculation steps. 
and we have an accelerate method that takes us takes a, an, a different body, another body, and we'll just apply all the Newton Newtonian gravitational acceleration for, gained from that body to our own velocity vector. And this method, by the way, is not different whether I use Barnes Hutt or whether I use the brute force method, because Barnes Hutt just limits the amount of these calculations that I have to do. Like I will call in Barnes Hutt, I will call accelerate less often. And body is kind of the only thing we need for the brute force method. And for Barnes Hutt, I introduced a few more classes. So we have the quadrant, which is like simulates a, pos a, a area in space. It's um, it has the same height and the same uh, width, so we only need one parameter for diameter, and we need like coordinates for its center. And the quadrant has helper methods that, that tell me like, is this body inside of this quadrant, or any of the subquadrants, of course? And it also has helper methods that give me subquadrants for northwest, northeast, southwest, and southeast. <coughs> and another another class that I have is the Barnes Hut tree. This saves a body <coughs> and it saves a quadrant. And as a helper method, it has the is leaf method. So is leaf is like, does this go on below this? Because of course the Barnes Hut tree is only like, it's recursive. So it will save like references to its four subtrees. <coughs> Apologies. And so if this is like a leaf, then we're like, we're, we're at the real body. Then we know that our, the body that we're saving here is a proper, simulated body, whereas if this is like not the end of the tree, then we can go, go down again into the deeper subtree. And we have the insert method that basically does like, okay, let's drop a body up, up in the root node, and then it will just like, just like propagate down. This does the splitting up and the addition of the masses and locations. Uh, we combine all these, these bodies into a system. So the system has a size that is just like the size of its largest quadrant, and it saves like a list of bodies, like this is a Python list of type body, of course. And in my implementation, I also added a solar mass because I like my bodies to revolve around a sun. So I, f I thought it funny to have just like always place a sun in the middle. And the system has like one main function that is the accelerate function. And the accelerate function goes through all the bodies, accelerates them with a Newtonian method, and then like just lets some time, some time pass for the simulation to actually take place, and then like does the same thing again. Like this, uh, this runs the simulation. And so here we diverge from brute force and Barnes Hut. So the brute force implementation, you've already seen that, right? Uh, I, I throw, threw this up on the, the slides before. Um, and Barnes Hut looks like this according to the paper. And this is a scheme, I think, which is a Lisp dialect. And uh, this is about what it looks like in Python. So we go through the tree, we say, like, okay, this is this a leaf, then we can just like accelerate the body that is there or accelerate using the body that is there. Otherwise, we check like, okay, are we like, are we like far away, far enough away to just like ignore everything below this tree, then we accelerate as well. And if not, then we just go one level deeper. And I have some examples here. So this, uh, on the left here, I have a video that is just rendering 10 bodies, just, they're just randomly scattered. So like don't, like don't be bothered by differences in the video. On the left side, I have a video of like 10 bodies rendered by brute force. And on the right, I have, I have 10 bodies rendered by Barnes Hut. And you can basically see no difference between them at 10 bodies. But once we go to 100 bodies, you begin to see like a slight stutter in brute force, whereas Barnes Hut is like, no sweat, no sweat. Uh, let's go to 1,000 bodies. And you can see, you see, you can see quite a difference. This is all rendered on, on this very laptop in battery mode, by the way. So your mileage might, may vary, of course, in frame rates. Um, but Barnes Hut stutters a little bit, but almost makes the 30 frames. Uh, brute force, definitely not. And now let's go to a thousand frames. And here, I'm in fact not gonna let the slide up on the screen long enough for you to see the second frame of brute force because Burns Hut is at about a second per frame, whereas brute force is about 65, 66 seconds per frame. Um, I didn't continue to render here, but instead I have this wonderful table for you. <coughs> 
So with 10 bodies, this is with the rendering commented out, so I can like, just show the performance of, uh, of, the, of the calculations. With 10 bodies, brute force is actually faster than Burns Hut because it doesn't have to create the tree. But as soon as we go to 100 and 1,000, you, like, you can see them like diverge. And by the time we reach 10,000, I was like, oh, should I even continue with brute force? And I was like, okay, let's do, let's do 100,000 with brute force, and it took quite some time. Whereas Burns Hut can do a million bodies in the same time that it takes brute force to calculate at 10,000 bodies. And this, like, this difference grows and grows. And of course, you don't have to display the animation at the same frame rate that you're rendering it. So the, this is a render of about 7,000 bodies, and it took about two hours to render on this machine. So that's about one or two frames per second. And this is rendered using Matplotlib. So what you're seeing is actually a graph with the, with the axes removed, and like the, the dots are like little graph dots, and the, the thickness is like corresponds to their mass. And I use the matplotlib animate function to render directly into an MPEG, but you can also render to the screen if you like want to use the interactive mode. And all the code is on my GitHub. I will throw up a link at the end of the at the end of the presentation. So now we have um, we have learned so much about orbits, about gravity, about big O notation. I hope. So let's have some fun with orbits. Um, I love space, like I am such a space nerd. And there's a few things that people, a lot of times people get wrong. So what I, what my goal is here in this last section of my talk is to give you like super tiny inkling of explanation, like what is in orbit, why does it work, and how do I land my spacecraft? <clears throat> so first thing is the launch. An orbit is in fact velocity plus gravity. So many people think that, oh, if I just like, point my rocket skywards, and I just go up, right? Then I'm like 400 kilometers up, and that's where like microgravity starts, like that's where the ISS is, and I will just stay there, right? Whereas in fact, if I do that, I will just like be like roadrunner, like ding, ding. Because instead what I should do is I should launch like in this parabolic fashion. Because what I want to do is like I want to pick up speed that is like sideways speed. And in fact, like once I've reached my, my desired orbital height, I will accelerate a little bit more to about seven kilometers per second for like low Earth orbit. And at this speed, the Earth's gravity will pull me down towards the center of the planet, but my speed will pull me sideways in a exactly the amount of, of uh, velocity that like the two forces combine to bring me into this, this circular uh, motion. And this is where I experience microgravity and then I'm in space basically. Uh, and like real rocket launches look actually like this. All right. So um, another thing about orbits is that basically I influence them mostly through changing my velocity. Uh, either by accelerating or by decelerating. So accelerating, I do that by just pointing into my direction of travel and just like firing my engine. That's called like prograde. Whereas like deceleration, I point my spaceship into the opposite direction. So like my engine is pointing into my direction of travel and then I fire the engine again and that's decelerating or that's like firing retrograde. And whenever I do that, like the opposite side of my orbit, like imagine this ellipse, right? then like the opposite side of my orbit will rise if I accelerate or like lower if I decelerate. And this is pretty cool because I can, I can do stuff like if I am at, hang on. So the lowest point of my orbit is called the periapse and the highest point of my orbit is called the apoapse. So like what I wanna do is for example, I wanna get to the moon. So I get myself into a stable orbit around the sun and I, uh, I then like choose the right, um, right, right moment in time and then just, just hit the gas and like, accelerate and then like my, my apoapse will rise so that the orbit will get more and more elliptical until the tip of the ellipse almost touches the moon. And then I just wait until I'm up there and then moon, moon's gravity catches me basically. So that's how I get to the moon. Um, if you're wondering 
I kind of wanted to skip those slides, so, but now I'm, I'm realizing I have a few minutes, so that's why I'm talking about this without slides. But now we're back from the moon. So we are returning, and what am I doing here? I'm, I'm just like thundering towards Earth, and I'm in fact gonna miss Earth, and I just like swoop around and go back. Right? So what I do is I wait until I'm at the periapse, at the lowest point of my orbit, and then I point my ship retrograde, so against the direction of travel, and I fire my engine. And this will make the highest part of my orbit slowly lower until we're about circular, but I'm not done yet. Like I'm continuing firing my engine until this part, the opposite part of my orbit is actually going down, 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 down. And here, we are, our lowest part of the orbit is actually inside the atmosphere, right? So now I'm done. I can just like turn off my engine and just wait until my ship hits atmosphere. And this will obviously slow me way down. Like I hope you have proper heat shields in your ship because this is gonna create a lot of heat. Like because you're slowing down from about seven kilometers per second, right? So the heat shields are deploying. You are, um, your, your speed gets reduced so your orbit gets like slower and smaller and smaller. It's not even an orbit anymore. This is like parabolical already. And so, like, your air brakes pop out, like maybe you have these grid fins that SpaceX has, and you see the, the body, uh, the, f the, the ground getting closer and closer, and, like, you fire your retro rockets or you activate your parachutes, and you've landed, and you're home. Thank you very much. Um, you can find me on any internet thing as Break the System. I'm on GitHub. Uh, my newest open source project is Ablator on ablator.io. And I'm Daniel. Thank you so much for listening. Um, please just, I guess, do we have time for questions or should I just, maybe one or two questions? Otherwise, first find me outside the hall. Yes, please. <clears throat> oh, you're getting a mic. Is it working? Yeah, okay. We have to use the mic, otherwise it's not on the video. So you, you had a quite um, crowded space in your simulation. Mm -hmm. um, the algorithm you presented is mostly about far away spaces with many objects and is optimized for that. So in, in this crowded situation, you have a lot of error, I think. The, uh, I know what you mean, and like, because it seems like they would like, bump into each other or they're like, so close that they should influence each other more. Um, but the thing is, like, of course, I, I, if, I, if the dot sizes were actually realistic, then you wouldn't see any of the dots. Because if I like, look at our solar system from, from the top, for example, it, I would just see the sun, because everything else is basically too small to see from so far away. Um, and that's why it kind of seems a, li a little bit unrealistic. But I can, like, I, I, I'm, very, I'm pretty sure it works. Like, if you imagine the dots to be actually kind of small and only, only as a visual help to be that large. Like for example, in that video that you saw, like you see the sun, like the hugest body that is actually shifting to the side because all the other bodies are kind of like, they're not, they're not, not all perfectly circular, so they're actually dragging the, the sun that is like thousands of times heavier than they are, just dragging them to the side. Mm -hmm. So there is interaction between the bodies. What there isn't in the simulation is there's no like crashing into each other. But this is actually very, uh, this doesn't happen very often. Like I've been thinking about like if they're uh, exactly the same coordinates, just like delete one of them or something. But I wanted to have like a pure implementation of Barnes Head first. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? Uh, this one? Oh. Yeah, what's the name of the paper, of the publication? Uh, the name of the paper is this. I will throw it up on the screen in a second. Here we go. This is the name of the paper, A Hierarchical O N log N Force Calculation Algorithm. So uh, I have two question, uh, questions actually. So first of them is uh, what do you do if uh, the body is uh, between two quadrants? And uh, the second is uh, how do you solve the problem with uh, uh, irregular forms basically? If it's if it, they're not circular. Um, first question is like, what do I do? I just like the quote, like the body also always ha has in my simulation has like an um, 
when splitting, I just use smaller than or equal. So the body will always be in one quadrant and not in the other. So because uh, in the simulation, the body is just a, a single point. It has one coordinate. And that also answers your second question because this simulation and Barnsard simulation doesn't care about if a body is irregular because it just treats a, a body as like one point that has a specific mass regardless of its size. And this is actually where it gets like a slightly, a uh, tiny bit imprecise, but this is good enough for a lot of stuff. And if you want to take this into account, what do you do? You would basically have to simulate like individual parts of the same body as their own like centers of gravity, but that gets complicated very, very quickly. And you probably have to go like into different physical equations because like just Newtonian physics is, is uh, probably not very able to deal with that. Anyone else with a question? Yeah. Okay, so uh, thank you, Daniel, for this wonderful talk. And thank you very much. Round of applause. <laughs>